On behalf of the Brandt family, I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is J.L. Young. I've been with Brandt since 2009. I work out at the Lexington office and uh, I sell seed out of the Lexington office and also support uh, the other five locations from a seed sales support standpoint. Today we're going to talk about soybeans and soybean management. Uh, the days of planting soybeans, spraying Roundup and harvest them I think are, are long gone and, and uh, we want to help you provide some management tools, uh, resources that you can use on your, on your farm. Uh, and just like, we, like Dan Fraley said here, we want to make sure that there's a return on your investment and this is a practice, practical research farm. So, so thank you for your time. Uh, today I have speaking with BASF is AJ Wood, Woodyard. Am I getting closer? The first time it wasn't quite that good, but AJ, I'll just call him AJ, and, and he's here today and going to help us speak at the stop uh, through that. So down at Pleasant Plains, I believe they got close to 400 acre research farm down at Pleasant Plains, and Ed Corrigan, our head agronomist, has emission trials, and he has these emission trials on corn and soybeans. And what we do in that emission trial is, is uh, we have a fully treated, fully, um, I, I guess, fully spoiled one end of the field, and you get down to the other end, and they're not very well taken care of. And uh, as you can see on here, uh, we break out each one so we know what management type and what treatment is, uh, is, is getting the best return on your investment. So that emission design down at Pleasant Plains is a 15, 50, 150 uh, suspension fertilizer in the fall with a brash herbicide. It's planted at 120,000 seed population. It's got three gallon of ammonium thiosulfate on. It's got a poncho votivo with quick roots for a seed treatment. Uh, we go into the glyphosate burn down prior to planting and then they go into their uh, three post trips. Um, the first one being a post applied tank mix with our trio and smart smart B at the first trifoliate. Then we go in secondly to our R1 with this trio and the smart B and then we go into our fungicide at R2, R3 time, time frame with the trio and also the smart B. So we are in a transition mode here at Brands. Um, we, we talked a lot about trio and soybean in the past and, and that's one thing through the slides here and even AJ will touch on it. We're, we're transitioning to a product to use on soybeans called Quattro. And it's, it's a little higher concentration of boron and it has no nitrogen that we took out for, uh, for tank compatibility reasons with a dicamba product. So, so as we move forward, we're going to use our trio products more on our corn, uh, and then our our quattro will be on the soybean soybean lineup. So on that emission design, what we did is uh, all those trials was a full treatment, and it's got 11 year data, but we're seeing a six year average return on our planting date trial. In 2016, last year at Pleasant Plains. April 13th, we harvested 100.3 bushel, excuse me, 100.8 bushel soybeans, which I find matches up to AJ's data very closely for last year. And then May 31st, we were at 55 bushels. So just off planting date alone, we were at 45 bushel better just off planting dates alone. Uh, obviously, when you plant that early, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about from you want a, your longer maturity soybean. You don't want to plant a 2-8 up here that early. We want to extend uh, with our maturity, uh, obviously planting conditions, populations, which we're going to touch about all these things as we go forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to AJ to talk on some planting date, variety of maturity, <coughs> and uh, he's going to touch on some things they've done down at their Seymour, Seymour Research Farm in Seymour, Illinois. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So the last in the last group, the guys back on the wagon got so excited they started jumping up and down and, and almost made the truck tip over. So don't you guys try to keep it down back there this time, okay? Uh, so just quick brief introduction. My name is AJ Woodyard. I am with BASF. So I did my best to get a little bit of red in my outfit today to try to fit in since I'm the outside guy. Um, but I sure appreciate the opportunity to be here. My role with I, actually a little background on myself. I'm from a farm. Uh, down around Paris, so East Central, for those that might be familiar. Still am involved in that operation with my dad. And then I also am lucky to have like the best job in the industry uh, because I get to focus on high yield strategies for corn and soybeans. 
but you'll find that I'm a soybean nerd through and through. I love soybeans, love talking about them. I actually have an, an allergic reaction to corn pollen if I don't take my meds. So if I go out in that field right now, I'm gonna swell up and I won't be able to tell you how excited I am about beans. But I think that was God telling me that uh, I needed to be a soybean guy when he gave me that allergy. So um, I'm all about, the same as, as what these guys are, our research farm just west of Champaign is, is all about strategies that drive more yield and ROI and return for you as growers. Uh, the benefit of me still being involved in the family operation is I know anything that we're researching has got to be practical for the farmer. And you'll find some of the things that I'm going to share are things that you can absolutely implement on your operation. I'll talk towards the end of the presentation about some things that we're trying to look at forward thinking that I think will be the next revolution in, in this whole yield driving that we've been after. Um, we've seen certainly some great things in soybeans and I think a lot of it's due to a lot of different factors that we have to consider when we're trying to manage for more beans. It's a completely different animal than dealing with corn. So you guys were at the corn stop previously, right? Wipe your brains of that garbage. You know, we're, we're thinking of something different now with soybeans. We've got we've to take a different mindset. So one of the things that I'll tell you that's absolutely driven yield for us in soybeans has been planting date. Absolutely, no doubt about it. That's been the foundation for what we've done for more yield. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the other pieces of the puzzle, but planting date has been the number one driver. And any time that we're thinking about these strategies and how it's going to influence yield, we've got to think about the three ways or the three uh, pieces of the puzzle that we can do to influence soybean yields. It's really, we have to increase the number of pods per acre, the number of seeds per pod, or the weight per seed. And we got to think about how our strategies, how we, the strategies we implement influence one of these three factors, or hopefully all three if, in the best case scenario. So we're always trying to, to tabulate that back to those particular yield factors and thinking about that. So from our research perspective, we have a, a rather large trial we put out every year where we've got about seven different planting dates and we look at multiple maturity groups. So we put out four maturity groups that range all the way from a 2.8 to a 3.940. Uh, we put out multiple seeding rates and then this year we've added the element of doing that in both 15 and 30 inch rows. Previous years, just 30s. Uh, but it gives us a wealth of information about how you have to take a different mindset in managing soybeans if you're planting on April 25th versus if you're planting on May 25th. It's a dynamic system that changes. We don't just set the, the planter at 175 and go the whole year. The system has to change based on planting date. So here's a, just a quick look at, at our system from last year, 2016, and I set this up to look at the far left side because that's something we're going to build on uh, going forward. We planted March 21st last year, the earliest we had ever planted, and uh, most people would think that was pretty crazy at Champaign. They took 30 days to come out of the ground. So they were in the ground for 30 days. Uh, they came up after those 30 days at nearly an 85% final stand versus our target. We had done that at three different populations. It was almost hard for me to believe what we had seen there, given everything they'd gone through. You're going to hear me talk a lot about it's, it's light interception with beans. And one of the things that planting earlier allows us to do is move that vegetative growth and get those plants bigger earlier in the year, get them into the reproductive phases, and get them flowering when we're still at our, around our longest day of the year, which allows us to intercept you know, maximum sunlight, longest days, while we're starting to fill pods rather than just growing vegetatively. So we planted March 21st, thought it had no chance of succeeding. It was our best yield in our plots last year. 100 bushel, a little over 100 bushel. You see, and I, let me just preface this by saying, am I telling you to go plant March 21st? Not necessarily, but I'm gonna tell you that soybeans can resolve a lot more than, and are much more resilient and able to take things that we didn't previously think they are. With new seed treatments, new genetics, this is a base for getting us more yield. But you even get out into these mid-April planting dates where I'm absolutely encouraging guys to get a go on it where they can. We've got yields up in the above 90 bushel range. You see our range down ended up at about 72 bushel in our early June planting date, so about a 28 bushel swing from top to bottom. Still a lot of dollars there to play with and a critical part of that foundation for raising more yield. One of the other things that's really interesting out of the work that we've done and, and are able to we're able to send, uh, and I failed to mention, I've got Jake Montgomery with me, my other celebrity. He's one of our summer interns from the U of I and is involved in gathering a lot of the data that I'm going to show here. 
And one of the values we have is a, a team of people who understand the physiology or the science behind what we're trying to achieve. And so if you think about what we were taught about soybeans, it's that they're photoperiod dependent, right? So what does photoperiod dependent mean with soybean? That they're not gonna flower until after what? Daylight. Daylight. It's all daylight driven, they'll start flowering after you get past the longest day of the year, depending on maturity group. So that's kind of what we've always been taught on soybeans. What we found, I've got a lot of stuff that some won't be able to see on this chart, but we've got three different bars. An orange bar that represents our April and then right at the beginning of May planting dates. <coughs> a green bar that represents the end of May, May 22nd, and a yellow bar that represents June 5th. And what you'll see is we've broken this out by each individual growth stage and the number of days those beans spend in those growth stages. I'll point out two things real quickly on this. On the far left side, that's vegetative. They spent in vegetative growth. So you would expect that if you planted a bean on April 15th, it would spend more time in vegetative growth than one planted on, let's say, May 22nd, right? Because as you get closer to the longest day of the year, you'd expect to spend less time in vegetative growth. But that is not what we actually learned from this work. We found that we spent the same number of days in vegetative growth, whether we planted April 15th or May 22nd. Why is that important? Because it tells us that there's actually a, a growing degree unit or heat accumulation trigger to flowering. So if we're able to plant earlier, we start that flowering earlier. And our objective is to get flowering, you know, we, we try to shoot for June 10th, but absolutely have them flowering prior to June 21st. No doubt about it. And we can do that based on the information that we see here. It's not necessarily all photoperiod driven. The other thing you'll notice is the R2 growth stage. So what happens when beans are in R2? They're growing from about right here up to about right here, where they're not as much fun to walk through anymore. That's the full flower stage. <coughs> so in our instance of planting earlier, we gain ourselves an extra eight to 10 days of growth in R2. So what does that mean? It means we put on more nodes per plant. The more nodes per plant we put on, that's more potting locations on each of those plants. So a big value to have an extra. I, I do a lot of traveling in the winter and presenting in various parts of the U.S. So about February 15th, I was out in North Carolina, and I got a call from our group at the research farm. You know, normally you're not even thinking about lining up seed or getting equipment ready, and they said, hey, we're getting, we're starting to get dry. There looks to be a window that we might be able to do something this weekend if we wanted to try to do it. And I started getting a niche, because I'm, boy, I need to get back out of North Carolina and get back to Illinois. So we had to get back and round up seed as quickly as we could. We were able to accomplish that, and we went out and planted on February 19th this year. And again, not to encourage planting February 19th, but to just understand the science of what it, is it possible to even get beans to come out of the ground planted February 19th. We got a snow event on March 13th, dropped a couple inches of snow on us. Uh, those beans were about a quarter of an inch from coming out of the ground. Our soil temperatures got down to 28 degrees. Uh, the air temperatures were about 13 or 14 for a couple nights in a row. I decided at that point that we would have an RIP rest in peace service for those beans because there was no possible way they were coming out of the ground. April 10th they started coming out of the ground. 50 days after we planted them. 50 days later. And uh, just another example of kind of the, the resiliency of these, this, this crop, its ability to, to come through a lot of tough environmental conditions. We also got a couple of frost events on these after they were out of the ground that, uh, that, that bronzed them up, didn't kill them off, 28, 29 degree days. So they're still out there today, and I'll actually show you here in just a minute uh, one of those plants right now where they're at today in the stage. Uh, we had, in our planting date study this year, we had everything from a February 19th all the way to, to June 2nd. We, on February 19th and March 6th, my we got a new 15 intro planter and my my our maintenance our farm hand said I just can't I cannot get it ready for you by then and I kept trying to kick him but he couldn't quite get there so <coughs> we had only 30 inch rows planted in February 19th and March 6th but on March 22nd we planted full four maturity groups in both 30 and 15 inch rows and this was probably February or March 22nd and April 13th were our two best planting dates at our site this year and commercially 
as well. We actually had about 600 acres of grower planted beans on March 23rd and March 24th down from Champaign to Bloomington to down to Springfield area that I know of, I guess. And, uh, and those are some of the best looking beans that I've walked this year. So it's fun to see kind of something go from research to, to the commercial side. But it's funny how you've got these two dates, I've got colored in green, then we, we had an April 24th planting date. I think everybody knows some of the challenges we got into ahead of the big rains. We had a lot of decisions to make about stands that were may have been not exactly where we wanted them. Uh, I'll tell you, ultimately, I looked at a lot of 75 to 80,000 stands this spring that I told guys to leave, and I'm glad we did it because they, they look good. They look good at this point. Um, in some cases, you know, we made other decisions to intercede some in, and that's a whole other discussion uh, we won't get to today. But May 18th was actually our date that I coded in red. It was the worst emergence date we had. May 18th, we got a crusting rain and it was warm, and we didn't get them out. We didn't. We got about 50 percent out of the ground, I think. Um, so it's it's funny how you just can't predict when the best days to, to go out there and plant are. It seems like more often than not we get hit on one of these these late May planting dates. Uh, just real quick while I'm while I'm at it, here's a same this is the same bean that's right behind me. So this 36x6 is part of our planting date study. This is the 36x6 is planted February 19th. Uh, we did get we had. I probably didn't plant them as thick as I would have in retrospect. We planted at 110, 128, and 160,000 in February. And the 160,000, we ended up with about a 90,000 final stand, which is more than plenty to get a really good yield number out of it. But this is where we're at with 90,000 final stand. Uh, we were doing pod counts you know, pretty consistently in the, the 80s to 125, 130 range. Uh, and you can just see the progress these have made. We're pretty well done putting new, new uh, flowers on these plants. They ended up with 24 nodes. So I always encourage guys to go out and count the number of nodes you got in your field on the main stem. 24 is about the max you'll get to. And as you get to later planting dates, that number will decrease. It'll go, it'll go lower. Um, just a couple other quick things, then I'll turn it back over to Yale here. So we have the fortune of having some nice tools. Sorry, I about swung this thing out into your, into your face there. We have some nice tools that we can use to gather really interesting information. One of those is what I call our soybean selfie stick. So we can go out, it's got a, a wand on this camera that we can put down underneath the canopy and actually shoot a picture from below the canopy. And it actually also gives us data or measurements on the amount of light that's being utilized by the plant versus the amount of light that's being utilized by the ground. And so just a little bit of information that I thought would be of interest because I'm all about getting as much light interception by the summer solstice as you can and getting them into the reproductive phases if you can. Planted March 22nd, planted April 13th, planted May 18th, 30 inch rows. We go everywhere from 53% of the light being utilized in 30s at May 22nd down to 12% on May 18th beans on June 21st, on the longest day of the year. And our growth stage is anywhere from full R2 down to just the B3 vegetative stage. 15 inch rows, same planting date, same variety. We're now at, uh, in March 22nd, we're at 76% of the light. At May 18th, we're at 32%. So we basically increase that number somewhere around 25%, the amount of light that's being intercepted by the plant in 15s. There is some value to that from a plant utilization of light perspective, certainly. But what do you think the bigger benefit is of eliminating 25% of the light from hitting the ground? Absolutely. And I, I think we all know we've got battles there, and if we can eliminate light, you know, this gives you a real measure of how much you're eliminating with narrower rows. One other thing that I think is, uh, this is really difficult to see, and I, so I do apologize, but I'll walk you through what, what we've got here. This is basically a measure of solar radiation from our 2016 season. And I, I do, I'm fortunate to get to work with a guy down in Georgia that some may have heard of named Randy Dowdy that raised 176 bushel beans. I was lucky to be a part of the team that helped um, advise on that effort. And one of the things that Randy and I always talk about is solar radiation in soybeans and, and, and 
getting light at the right time and getting high levels of solar radiation. So I'll just give you an example of what it looked like for us here in, in 2016. Uh, we Early in the year, this is up until about July 4th, we were getting a lot, way above average solar radiation, a lot of sunlight early in the year. We'd driven our number way above the 10-year average. Everybody remember about July 4th last year, it got cold on the 4th, and then we started losing sunlight the rest of the year on out. And that's kind of diagrammed here. You see all these numbers way below the average, and our blue line just goes down, 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 down. So just to give you a, an idea of what that looked like for our planning dates, our March 21st planning date last year started flowering on June 4th. Okay, so June 4th is out here. Basically for the next month, after those started flowering, our solar radiation was way above average. So we were starting to, to set flowers and pods with way above average solar radiation. Now our May, now let's look, think about our May 20, I think it was May 23rd planning day. May 23rd started flowering on July 9th. So almost a month later, they started into the reproductive phases. Look at what solar radiation was doing for the next month after they started flowering. It was all below average. And that ended up with a 25 bushel difference in yield. So it's also important to think about you know, when we're getting that solar radiation and how that can influence uh, potential yield as well. One of the benefits of that earlier planning. A couple more things, then I'll turn it back over, that I think are just important agronomic pieces. Uh, Yale mentioned it, but we're proponents of, as part of our system and as we're looking at these large trials, we're discovering that if we're planting earlier, we want longer season beans. So in our trials, that's a 3.5 to a 3.9, somewhere in there, and maybe a 3.3 three to a 3.7 for you. I, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I will tell you, we've planted all the way out to a 4.7 and been able to get them to harvest uh, down there in Champaign, which is pretty crazy. But if we plant early, we can get there. We can get them there. So we're planting a longer season bean in our early planting dates. And we feel like that's allowing us to get, we're seeing about a four to five bushel benefit to being with our longer season beans versus our early season planted early. Now, if we get a year where we can't start planting until May 10th, let's just say it rains all of April, we can't start the planters rolling until May 10th, I'm gonna tell guys to go plant your early season varieties first. Because from about May 10th to May 25th, we see no difference by maturity groups in terms of yield. And ultimately, when we get past May 25th or later in the year, we actually see benefit to going back to a longer season, being late in the season. So that's kind of it's where I say it's a dynamic system. It changes a lot based on when you're able to get out there with the planter. Population changes a lot too. And I'll share this real quick um, because seeding rates, I think, are something you need to consider as part of that system as well. This is 30 inch rows um, in this case. 30 inch rows in 2016, averaged across four varieties. We got the green bar is 128,000 seeded rate, yellow is 160, the white is 192. You can think about where you fit in that system. Final stands were at 116, 145, and 173. What we found is anything in our April or early May planting dates, you got your highest yields with 116,000 final stand in 30s. So anywhere from a bushel, to a three and a half bushel benefit to being at lower populations. I can tell you that the main reason why we see that is at really high populations, you get a lot of inner row competition. So you'll see spindly stocks, they'll try to grow really tall and they're more susceptible to lodging versus our lower seeding rates, they'll stack those nodes one right on top of the other. We get good standability and, and we see yield benefit to that. So then how, what, our 15, so yep. what, where are you at? I'll get, I'll get there here in just one okay. second. So if you get later in the year, we actually go back to higher populations. Because the benefit of early planting is more nodes per plant. Remember I said that, you might get 22 to 24 nodes per plant versus being at 17 or 18. So we can go with the lower populations when we get later with fewer nodes per plant. How do we make up for that? By putting more plants out there. Okay, so that's how we, that's how we flip that for 15 inch rows. That's a good lead into a slide I didn't show last time, but I'll show it for the purpose of your question. I believe that you need to be at a minimum of 15% higher in 15 inch rows, seated rate. So if you say you're comfortable with 120,000 in 30 inch rows, take that number, 15% is what, another 20,000-ish, so be at 140,000 
So, and that's just due to the fact what we have seen in our work is anywhere from basically a, a 9% up to a 20% difference in stands of our 15s versus 30s, and it's all having friends to help push. So if you get into a, a tough you know, emergence scenario, you want more plants in the 15s. The 30s have all those friends right in the row to help them push through the crust. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a little bit of the agronomy, and let me just tell you that you got to buy into the agronomy in this high yield system and then pair that with the crop management because that's where the real success, the synergy comes. It's, you can do one or the other, maybe have some level of success. Uh, yeah, but would you recommend your dad down in Paris, Illinois, to ever plant his beans ahead of his corn? Yeah, that we did. You, you do that? We started, basis. we started beans uh, at home April 10th this year and started corn April 14th. Does that just kind of go against the nature when you're looking at those 35 degree, 40 degree uh, wet spells, you know? And, and how deep you plant at that stage? Um, we'll, plant, we'll plant an inch and three quarters to two inches early. Believe it or not. The soybeans out there without some kind of protection. Uh, as, as we move into earlier planted soybeans. Uh, uh, one thing I have here is, is some soybeans and, and behind me and I'll move out of the way so we can see, but uh, Dan Fraley planted these soybeans here, the 36X6s, April 17th, I believe, was the day they were planted. And as you can see right behind us, you guys are almost setting right to the line uh, from uh, no seed treatment, here guys is right, and to the left that's fully seed treated with inoculant. So to me, if you don't learn by anything AJ or anybody else said and you learn by visuals, this is a fully treated soybeans with inoculant, a Levo, planted April 17th, and this was an untreated planted the same day. So and like I said, you can see this row down here. So in 2018, Brantz is going forward uh, with a new product. Uh, last night I was watching the news, and I'm sure all of you guys have seen the, the Nema Strike commercial. And one thing I, I enjoy working about the Brant, working with the Brant family is we're always leaders in the industry. And I uh, thank Springfield Crew for being that innovation leaders. And before Monsanto was a big pusher on this nematode control, we started pushing uh, Poncho Votivo, and that's currently what behind us. And there are some differences between the two with the Nema Strike and the Poncho Votivo. The first thing I'm going to do is go over some last year's results here on the Lexington Research Farm. And we had 32x6s, so a 3-2 maturity, uh, untreated. And, and I would say 70 to 80 percent of what we sell is A1 with Poncho Votivo. Uh, so the A1 is three modes of actions of fungicide, and then your Poncho is your insecticide at a 500 level with your with your Votivo. So as you can see, from untreated to the A1 PV, uh, we are about 13 bushel. Uh, better from a seed treatment standpoint here at Lexington, so it's local data um, from that standpoint. And then after that, we can add on the inoculant, the Levo, and uh, even the fully loaded there on, on, the, on the right, right there on the end for a fully loaded. So we go from a 75 to an 83 bushel, but you also, it's all about return on investment, correct? So your first chart is probably a five to six dollar investment get over clear to the right, you're probably at about a $30 investment in seed treatments. But we believe, as, as we talk about the whole systems approach, as we get these soybeans in the ground earlier, we definitely got to get them treated uh, with that. And like I say, we're, we're probably 70% with that A1 Pancho Votivo. We were in, in 17. and 18, what we're going to, uh, we're going to go to a ne NEMA Strike technology. I don't know if they touched on it in the corn stop. It's going to be the same technology is used in the corn. Uh, not a lot of us probably do much nematode testing to know if we're out there, uh, but you can see their distribution. Uh, they feed on the root plants, and once that nematode starts feeding, it's going to allow other things to get in there, uh, such as uh, infections from bacteria and fungal, and also transmission transmits a lot of viruses. Other systems uh, symptoms that we may think it looks like, and we've had some of that this year, is drought-like uh, drought -like, um, look-alikes, and you think, well, that's all drought or yellowing from malnutrition or disease, but it could be some nematodes working on your soybeans. Uh, so that's one thing we want to take a look at uh, as we go forward. Drop that one. I know University of California, I, I did see this at Berkeley, put this data out. 10.6 
percent of soybean yield potential is what we're losing on our soybeans. So let's say we're shooting for 70 bushel beans. We're losing uh, seven to eight bushels in our nematode control. So if I was a Monsanto employee, I probably couldn't say this over here, but what they're seeing over here in over 600 replication data points in the last three years, and I believe there is four soybeans in McLean County this year, and Brands has one in Gridley, is seeing a three bushel advantage over the competitive standard. So that competitive standard may be on that board or maybe not. So if we're seeing a 13 bushel advantage from your Poncho Votivo to your untreated right here, and with over 600 replicated trials, they're saying we're gonna see an additional three bushels per acre. Uh, that's gonna be pretty exciting. If, if those are the numbers over the last two years and we have our own, we'll have our own data this year, and then the other thing, the biggest difference between the Nema Strike and the Poncho Votivo is, is Nema Strike is an actual nematicide and it's going to kill those nematodes. So once they're fed on, it's going to kill it and it's going to last up to, to 75 days. And so we should have two, if not three generations of those nematodes that it's going to control. Versus the Poncho Votivo, you were just making a area that you were protecting and this is going to stay with the roots and actually going to protect them roots for 75 days and actually kill the nematodes as a root, as a root continues to grow. Hey, what, are you, what are you substituting for insecticide then, your regular insecticide? So that's going to be your Acceleron insecticide, and, and that's going to be on, on the next slide. So these are the, the options that we have, and, and this year we offered a basic, standard, and elite, correct? So this year, the basic is just your fungicide only, then the standard is, this is the original one, it's going to be insecticide and fungicide. So this is what your standard is that you're talking about. Now this is going to be a standard FN, a fungicide and nematicide with no insecticide. So if you don't believe you have insecticide pressure, uh, or you want to add a Levo on here, um, this is going to be your, your F and N, your fungicide and your nematicide, and then your elite. So I would say the, the brand salespeople, and we've seen the data over here for your return on your investment, we're going to be saying that this is the, the group where we're going to go. So it's going to have your fungicide, your nematicide, your plant health, and your insecticide all on, on the elite package. So does that's that inoculate too? No, no, that's, this is just your, your basic three or four groups. And then on all these, and this is where it gets confusing because I, the growers I work with, and you go out and ask them, well, what's your seed treated with? Well, I don't know, it's just treated. And it's getting very complex. So these are your basics. We can add a Levo to all four of these, or one, pick one. So the 007 SAT is a finishing product for soybeans, and Brant's did this on all products last year. It helps the flowability, helps keep the seed treaters, uh, helps keep your equipment cleaner on the flowability. This B200, uh, will be used on all elite and what this is it's a biological products that will help those soybean uh, roots uptake N, P, and K. Uh, we didn't go into this the first stop but as we all know soybeans need what how much nitrogen depends who you talk to I would say four to five units of nitrogen per bushel so let's say 70 bushel soybeans that's 350 units of nitrogen and how many does those uh, nodules produce? A lot of people in the industry say about 50%. So where are we getting our other 50? Hopefully mineralization. Some people are even doing some research on adding applied nitrogen as well. But this is gonna help that soybean uh, with an enhanced uh, nutrient uptake. So this will be on there as well. And then here's what you're asking about the inoculants, optimize or tag team. Can add or mix and match any of these on any of these but these are going to be our four basics that's a very complex mix so even if you don't buy seed from brands i would get with your seed supplier and know what you're getting and the other thing i would ask you guys of your seed supplier know what rates you're getting and i would encourage you to know from your other suppliers what rates these are getting so yeah it's here's our four basic seed treatments and and these are going to be provided on our elite treatment automatically and we can put optimize or any kind or tag team any inoculant and alevo on any mix or match of these so it, it is a very complicated mix and match 
a, a tool from that standpoint. Does the advantage of inoculant go down as planting date gets later? From inoculant, you know, I don't know. My biggest, uh, from, from planting dates, I would say not, because that soybean's going to need that units of nitrogen uh, no matter if you're planted early or late. Now we're just showing what AJ just said, you're going to see your biggest bang for your buck on your earlier planted soybeans. So if you're planting June 1st versus April 15th, I would say all seed treatments may go down. But, but I would still rather start with a healthy bean June 1st than a non-healthy bean. Um, but I would say um, your inoculant, my first choice for inoculant would be your five, six, seven year corn on corn coming out where you need that inoculum out there would be my first choice on, on the inoculant, whether it's optimized or tag team LCO. So those are the choices that we have to offer for next year and they're pretty exciting. Like I said, we got some, we got some uh, four in McLean County on, on the NEMA strike trials out here. So as we see, uh, AJ talked a lot about variety and maturity. We just talked about seed treatments. The sulfur Ed Corrigan and, and uh, even Dan Fraley out here has put some ammonium thiosulfate uh, on these soybean plants and we're seeing that there's some, some real good results there. And then these next uh, two or three kind of go together, your, your fungicide at R3, your insecticide and your bee molly at R2 and R, R3 and then your trio. Uh, like I said earlier with, this, with the smart trio we're going to be transitioning into quattro is where we're going going forward with and then the B Molly would be the smart B Molly Mo uh, that R2 R3 time frame from applicating that on our soybeans. Um, AJ talked a little bit about it but I'll let you talk a little bit about the micros and your experience with the brand products that you had. Yeah so I I just say that you know the, the fortune we have in, in having a research site like this or Pleasant Plains or what what we do at, at Seymour it's a tapestry to go basically paint a picture that may be different than the way we've historically done it and it allows us a, a starting point to build onto something that can go commercial. And so that's the neat part about what we get to do with all of this, this I guess these different projects. So one thing that we're, we've talked about, kind of the basic agronomy, Yale's mentioned I'm a big believer, you know, if you think about the yield components and the weight per seed and the seeds per pod, a lot of it comes from this late season management side of things, the fungicides, insecticides, and the nutrition as well. One of the fortunate parts for me of, of having the chance to work in a and with a guy that raised 176 bushel beans is you're forced to think very differently than what you normally would in a in our standard system and kind of think outside of the box. So with Randy, you know, we did a lot of things that you all would look at us like we were completely crazy, but um, but I think it. It's those scenarios that gives us the ideas that boost into the next big things for us here in the, in the Midwest. And so one of the things that we're focused a lot on um, is in conjunction to something that, that I think, you know, Randy kind of put from a, a farmer's common sense perspective, he went out and said, hey, I'm gonna tissue test every week in my crop and I'm gonna build a baseline by nutrient and growth stage or growing degree units of what my nutrient load looks like in the plant and correlate that also to basically GPS soil samples as well to see what's going on in the soil throughout the year. And the neat part of doing that is it builds you a baseline that you can reference back if you've got the GDUs that you've accumulated each time you pulled those tissue tests, it gives you a baseline that you can go try to beat in subsequent years. And he's used that as, as I'll tell you, his main strategy for hitting the yield numbers that he's gotten to. And we've we did a lot of things that, um, you know, there's a lot of nutrients out there. I won't go into a lot of details, but we put a lot of nutrients out there to get it to get it to where we're at. Um, but I think that nutrition program was a big part of how he got his program where he did. We're doing the same things here now. We, we started last year with a weekly tissue testing. Uh, we have the ability at our research site to do fertigation like Randy does down there so we can put nutrients through the pivot. We also understand that most of us are not in an irrigated system, so we have to be able to start to figure out how to do this in a dry land environment as well, unless we're magically all going to start putting up pivots. So um, that's kind of where our uh, work and research with Brandt has come into play. Uh, they're certainly strong providers of foliar nutrition and foliar nutrient products. And that's something that, in my discussions with Randy, we started identifying certain things that kept showing up in our tissue tests. 
uh, one of those being like boron, for example, showing up in both corn and beans, or copper is another one that we've seen really starting to show up in our tissue tests. And we've looked at, had to be creative and look at ways that we can address that. And I'll tell you that we've worked with a lot of different products. Uh, we have a lot of companies in trying to work with us on, on some of these projects. I, I consider it a success if you can go spray a product and it <coughs> moves the nutrient or the tissue test after you spray it. And we've had a lot of good fortune with the brand products. Uh, the boron product of, of Brant moves boron every time we spray it. Uh, we just sprayed Brant copper product on our soybeans here this week that moved our copper numbers. And so I'm really, I've been really thrilled with what we've seen out of, out of those particular products and as part of our high yield system. We're still trying to understand the art with the science, right? Because you, you gotta, you gotta understand nutrient uptake, nutrient uptake curves when nutrients are taken up by soybean plants, and then hopefully time those applications. You know, for example, copper. That's a that's a, a nutrient that the soybeans need during seed production, seed fill. So we're just making our copper applications, you know, at, at R3, R4, right ahead of seed fill, rather than doing it early in the year. So I think there's some art with the science that we still understand but uh, I think this is a good group to pair with in terms of the products they provide in that market that can help you with the management side along with the good agronomy. Thanks AJ. With that I just handed out the high yield soybean management program and, and I probably if you came from the corn stop had, had one of these down there as well. And what this is down south uh, they started that this year and I think uh, Kyle and Ed and the crew down south have 40 or 50 of these trials, high management corn and soybeans out this year. And uh, what we're promoting to, to pick your best field, corn or soybeans, and, and here we're talking about soybeans down here at this stop. And, and let's put some, some management things that we've talked about today. And it's gotta be a whole systems approach, just like AJ said, it can't just be one of these things. It's gotta be a whole systems approach. So what I handed out is the is high yield soybean recommendations. Uh, like I say, pick, pick one field and get with your brand, plant manager, your brand salesman, 